please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button as well as the bell to be notified of future videos. Thank you. Hello Internet. Great for you to come and visit us today again here at Legacy Conversations. Um, the point of Legacy Conversations, one of the many points, is to capture history. It's the legacy. It's untold stories that we are acutely aware of that are going lost. So when I tell you today we've got uh, a return visit from uh, uh, an ex-SAF member. Now, this always makes me happy to speak with uh, Saint Afrikaans Alagmach Mana. Anyway, uh, blowjobs, as you other other lot used to call us. Blowjobs. We're good. We're good. We took you there and back. Anyway, um, there'll be a card here of uh, who I'm speaking about. But uh, it's a very special man, this. Very special. I've, I've come to know him slightly in a few dealings, and uh, he makes me laugh. And that's very, 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 very lucky. So um, I'm going to ask him, before he tells us the story that I think is necessary uh, to be captured um, he has a very, very interesting story to tell us. But just before we get there, uh, I'm introducing you to Steve Scott. And his current role is he is a lecturer at Coventry University in the UK. Would you tell us a little bit more about yeah. how that ties into your, your life in aviation? I'm going to say welcome here. And I do Really enjoy chatting with you, so this is going to be a good one. Thanks again for coming to speak with us. Well, for see, first of all, um, I have to say thank you to you guys for, first of all, coming up with this idea for Legacy. It's a very, very important um, idea and very, very important for people. I, I notice when I watch and I listen to the videos, you can see how people appreciate the opportunity to talk. So for me, that's for probably the main issue. Not for not for everybody, but you can see the guys that were really under pressure and in really hot uh, operational uh, memories when they're talking about those. Um, it seems to me that that seems to help a heck of a lot. So uh, in my case, it's a little bit different. I'm just telling you um, interesting stuff and, and funny stuff. So I wasn't under much pressure. So it's a little bit different. But um, for everybody else, it sounds to me or it looks to me like it's a... It's a, a, a this legacy has an important role for certain individuals. So first of all, thank you from my side. It's a great, a great um, vessel that you've got going. That's for sure. Um, <clears throat> getting back to what you asked me, what is my present job? Um, as you know, I flew airplanes for, for 35 years, first in the SAF, in the Air Force, and then I moved over to the commercial line. Um, and then sort of towards the end of, the last sort of five years or something, I thought, no, I can't do this forever. I, I need to, my brain is going a bit uh, haywire. It's getting a bit foggy. Um, and that was mainly due to sort of the long distance flying. We were flying 15, 16 hours at a time, spending two days at home, and then off you go again. Um, so then I thought to myself, I, I, I need to do something else. Otherwise, my brain's going to get, you know, it's going to go, it's slowly going dead or it's dying. Um, anyway, then I decided to um, go back to academia because I was I had done that before. Um, I did a PhD, and then during my PhD, the dean that was actually my supervisor was from Coventry University, um, and he was an engineering guy. Uh, and my PhD was in basically decision making amongst pilots, um, and uh, he was fascinated. He couldn't understand this, you know, decision making. What's this? And um, What's this human factors type stuff? Um, so I sort of after the, you know, around about the second year, I, I actually came, I flew in here and I went to go and see him and I actually made a presentation to explain to him what is human factors and why it's so important. Um, and I actually also said to him, listen, why don't you, why don't you have human factors for the engineering students um, instead of them later on in life, learning about human factors or having human factors specialists why don't you give it to them as a basis? Um, and he mulled that over and chewed it over. And lo and behold, uh, two years later, he phoned me up and said, hey, listen, um, would you like to come and do that at the university? 
Um, so that's how it all started. Um, I wasn't an academic by as such. So he employed a couple of other chaps. Uh, my boss's name is um, Don Harris, which is probably one of the, if you look at in the aviation world, in, in the human factors world, there's three guys, basically, uh, big, big names in human factors, guys that have written books, that have presented at conferences, um, uh, that are well known in the industry. So I would say like one of them is Sydney Decker, um, who's down in, in, in Brisbane now, um, very good colleague of mine, good friend of mine. He's probably one of the well known human factor guys. Um, the other one is he Eric Kulnachel, um, Dutch guy that's over now in the States. Um, and he also does really interesting stuff. He's, he's the sort of the author of the latest sort of safety two type thinking. Um, and then, of course, Don Harris. Um, not that he's third or anything like that at all, but um, he's my boss now. And, um, and he's written many books and uh, he's been involved in all sorts of projects across the US. And he's on all sorts of um, committees um, up at government level, things like that. So it was a great opportunity for me to work with one of these guys. And when it came up that I could maybe work with Don, I took it uh, and uh, got out of flying and then started uh, teaching at, uh, at Coventry University. Um, and basically what we do is we just teach or we try and teach. We try and inform uh, the engineers. Engineers are very different, by the way. You know that. <laughs> um, to try and inform engineers how the brain works. Um, so that they can understand and uh, maybe design things a little bit more intuitively, um, and take into account the human element, as it were, our strengths and our weaknesses from a from a cognitive point of view. Um, so that's basically what we do. We teach uh, engineers how the brain works, or we try to anyway. Um, and then that's sort of a third of my job. Uh, and the other sort of two thirds of job is is research. So we actually have um, we bid for projects with our third party uh, consortium partners. Um, and then if we win the bid, then we do whatever research we do at the time. So um, I'll give you one little example. We do, uh, uh, I did a project with uh, BAE Systems um, and they, their helmet that they use in the fighter aircraft is called the Striker helmet. Um, and they've got a head up display so we uh, did a project with them to, to upgrade and update that uh, head-up display facility. Um, and then, of course, that led to other projects and going on going forward. So, yes, um, a third of my job is academia at the university, lecturing with uh, engineering students. Um, and then two-thirds is, is, is PhDs, um, doing research with consortium partners. Um, yeah, and so that's what I do. Um, it's really lovely to be able to, uh, how can I say this, to sleep in my own bed at night. It's wonderful. After all the years of flying airplanes, it was great. It's great to be back. And I sleep like a baby now. And that's, that's wonderful. Um, so, yeah, that's where I am at the moment. I'm up at six o'clock in the morning to go and swim uh, with all my old girlfriends. Um, they're all in the 70s and 80s. And boy, they, can't, how, how, they can hardly walk to the pool. But when they're in the water, they like fish. Um, and then there's no dilly dally, lots of running and uh, lots of laughs and jokes. But when you're in the water, you have to swim, and and so it's great fun. Um, so yes, I, I do a bit of swimming, I do a bit of university, and then the weekend, of course, is is rugby of some sort. Um, so and then Tuesday nights, Thursday nights as well. So anyway, so that's it in 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 a nutshell, uh, what I do at Coventry University. Thank you very much for that. Now uh, I'm going to slip something in here. Uh, Go to the Coventry University website and put in Steve's name and you can see there he's been involved with quite a few, as he says, projects there and uh, partnered in papers written. And uh, it's very, very interesting stuff for, for me with a basic understanding of, of aviation and aeronautics and the kinds of things to see at what levels these people design aeroplanes and why why they do what they do it's very very good to, to 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 sort of go down that is a total rabbit hole if you're interested and uh steve one of his his roles was something that i if i ever regret about doing um certain jobs i would have loved to have been an accident investigator now 
now now you you want to tell us a story i know the bones of the story um it's very very interesting and there's one point there i i named this meeting and i spelt it wrong i named this meeting um flying the puppet masters around or something like that so yeah i'm gonna let steve tell us all about that because really there's a, a key fact in yeah but it's over to steve to do that for us okay um so that uh that heading that you gave is quite uh, apt i must say and um you will if you listen to my little story um write the last sort of statement i have the second last statement i have will highlight what that is all about um so let me let me put this into perspective then um so at the time in the 1980s um there were three squadrons down in cape town uh, 25, 27, and 35 squadrons down in Kapstadt. Um, I was fortunate enough at the time to fly at both 27 and 35, and even as a guest pilot for, for 25 squadrons. So I flew with all three. I have um, to correct you. 22 squadron is also there. Don't forget the, the chopper mana. I'm going to say 22 are there as well, but I'm just talking about the aviation guys that I flew with, but you're quite right. 22 were there as well. We used to always have them in the pub. And that was a different story. Those guys sat over there and they used to call us over or they came over when we got, you know, after a few. So it was always good fun, eh? <laughs> um, so um, these three squadrons, they basically supported a King Air, a B-200 King Air, and a B-80 Queen Air that were based up in Eros Vintuk. Um, and these are sort of semi-VIP transport um, uh, aircraft. Um, and we used to support them with sort of two-week deployments, as it were, two-week bush tours based in Eros. Um, the King Air had a permanent manager with um, Captain uh, Herman Habich, who ran the King Air, top-class aviator, by the way. That guy could fly so, he was a smoothie himself, but he could fly so super smooth. The passengers didn't even know they were on or off the ground or if they were turning or anything. Super, super guy and a uh, top class aviator. Uh, anyway, so the, the King Air had uh, Hammond managing it, um, and the Queen Air was a, a one man, totally independent operation. Um, at the time, I'd, I'd operated both aircraft over that past two years. Um, and this chat on Legacy is about one particular sortie uh, that I enjoyed while I was on the Queen Air as, uh, as a deployment. Right, so um, just for those folk that are not that interested, the Queen A, um, it's a beach B80, um, it's a twin engine, 350 horsepower, six cylinder, nine seater aircraft, weighs around about, uh, max takeoff weight is about four tons, um, the cruising speed is um, around about 300 knots, so it's what, what, 550 kilometers an hour, and uh, the range is about 1500 nautical miles, so that's around about two and a half thousand k's. Um, and of course, you could fly up to 25, 26,000 feet, but uh, we used to operate at around about 10, 12, 15,000 feet when we flew around that part of the world. Um, right, so that's that's the aircraft that where it came and how it operated. In that. So now I'll talk about the trip itself. Um, so I arrived in Vintuk this one fine day. Um, and when I arrived, I went up to the... Um, uh, South African uh, Air Force Command Post there, there at uh, Western Air Command, just to go and check if um, up on the board to go and check if there were any flights for the Queen there. And um, when I saw there it was nothing planned, only a, one flight sort of towards the end of the second week. And I was really, I remember, I was really disappointed. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? But anyway, later that afternoon, I get a telephone call. I must come and see Brigadier Dick Lord. Um, I thought to myself, geez, like, you know. What have I done now? Am I in trouble again? You know, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, so uh, after greeting him, I went up and after greeting him, I, uh, he asked me, um, have you got any plans for, for this week? So I said to him, I'm here on the Queen Air. Um, I look on the board, there's nothing there. So um, I don't know, unless you've got something for me. So I said, come with me. So we went into his office and he closed the door. Um, and he said, um, right, um, uh, what I'm going to tell you now is all sort of Machniseni. Um, we've got three diplomats that are here for the United Nations 435 negotiations, which starts um, the next Monday in Rokana. The next phase of it, anyway, was in Rokana in, two, in a week's time. 
Um, basically, he said, listen, I need you to keep these busy these visitors busy for five days. Um, they are Two of them are ex-USAF pilots. One is a helo driver and one was a transport guy. And um, one was a, a keen hunter and, and uh, they all enjoyed fishing. So I want you to think about um, ways to keep them busy for the next five days. So I said to him, I said, Sure, okay, that's great. What's my budget? And he just laughed. He said, listen, he has a, he has a pad. You sit here, you work out an itinerary for me, and then come and find me when you're finished. So I sat there at his desk, and I quickly made a sort of a, a, a plan, basically fly to Etosha. First of all, I was I think I thought, man, I'm going to have one night or something. I'll take them down to Swakop or something like that, or Sosus Flay or whatever it is, and then come back. But five days, I thought, oh, this is fantastic, you know? When does a when does a guy get a chance in the air force in South African air force to actually design an, his own trip? Fantastic. Anyway, so I designed basically um, a night in uh, Itosha, um, a night in Rundu, a night in Katima in Mapacha, and then across to Terrace Bay and then back. Um, so I worked out a bit of a route and times and all that, and I went to go and see uh, the brigadier. I think it was brigadier. Was he colonel then? I can't remember. Anyway. I went to go and see Dick Lord and I gave it to him and he sort of looked at it and he said, that's good. What time do you want to leave tomorrow? Tomorrow, You know, like short, sweet, to the point. No, no fuss, no bother. So I said, okay, well, how about nine o'clock? Um, and that was it. Anyway, the next morning, the three gents were there bright and early. Um, so I introduced myself and I gave them a bit of a, a briefing, as it were. Um, I put the map on the, on the, on the aircraft wing. And I said, um, so we've got five days. This is our kind of our route. Uh, of course, everything's flexible depending on what you want to see and all that. Um, um, told them why and where we're going and what it is all about um, with all the different bases that were there, uh, which, by the way, they knew, which was quite interesting. Um, I also told them, look, there's a, there's a seat up front with me. Um, you're most welcome to come and sit in the back and talk and do whatever you want to do. But if you want to sit in the front, you're most welcome. I'm not going to keep on inviting you guys you must just come and sit and and i must be honest they were very keen and they were there was somebody in that seat every single time um anyway and then i gave them the rest of the briefing as you know in emergencies or potential problems and whatever it was um so um so yeah just to reiterate one was a helicopter pilot a previous helicopter pilot one was a transport guy and the other one is a, a kind of a pure diplomat as it were um the two aviators as I got to know them, um, I got to realize they were very, very experienced chaps. They had been involved in quite a few of the overseas U.S. campaigns. Um, so I had lots and lots of experience, lots of lots of flying experience, operational experience. Um, you will have noticed that um, I have not and I probably will not be using their names today. Although their names are freely available on the Internet, um, you'll see why, or you'll hear why at a later stage, why I'm not going to use the names as such. Okay. Um, I will also sort of break this chat into two basic areas. One will be about the actual flying, and the other will be about the, the politic. Uh, politic with a K, what I use it as. Okay. Politic, as it were. Right. Um, is that okay for you? For C, does that make sense? Okay. Good Absolutely. Stuff. You just carry on. Uh... Okay, cool. Right. <clears throat> um, so the first sort of flight then was from Eros, Vintuk, to, to Tosha Pan. Um, the helicopter pilot jumped in with me uh, for that short flight. Um, we, we flew reasonably uh, low level, about uh, 1,500 feet all the way. Uh, when we got to the pan, we flew all the way around the plan to show them the, uh, the game and all that. Um, and then we landed there just sort of in time for lunch. Um, the park folks themselves had obviously heard um, that my guests were diplomats. So we were allocated five-star lodges over, look, overlooking the pan. Absolutely beautiful. Um, the rainy season had just started sort of probably about two weeks before I had arrived. Um, so the pan was sort of semi-dry, but there was a pool that the water had started to pool up. Um, so we had lunch, I remember, and then went on the game drive. And boy, the place was just teeming with animals. Um, absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. Um, later that evening, or when we got back, um, they, they had organized to go hunting. Um, and they had arranged to go hunting that evening. And then again, early the next morning. 
in time to be back for lunch so that we could then fly to Rundu. That was the plan, of course. Anyway, the next, um, uh, that night we had a lack of meal. Uh, and then the next day comes uh, lunchtime, comes two o'clock, comes four o'clock, they haven't arrived. And then I realized, okay, that's not going to work. So I phoned Vintuk and um, I changed our itinerary, said, look, we're probably going to skip Rundu. We're going to carry on straight um, uh, if and when they come back. Anyway, later that evening, they arrive and they got big smiles. They are so chuffed. They're so happy with everything. The one guy that was the keen hunter had bagged a, a stunning, absolutely stunning, um, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, King Kudu beautiful you know massive horns uh something i can't i think it was like 235 kilograms or 238 kilograms huge beast um spectacular absolutely spectacular and he had arranged um to have it uh, mounted and, and everything and sent back to his home in the states um so they were really really chuffed they were uh, they were over the moon um uh, anyway that evening was um was uh, was this the second evening and it was quite amazing because now the group was in good spirits and uh, the meal was fantastic and uh, the the beers and the wine was flowing and the conversation started you know it's really got going and I'll talk about that as part of the politic as it were a little bit later on okay um, anyway the next morning uh, we decided then so this was on the third morning we decided then to fly from katima to to um, to uh, sorry from itoshi to katima to mapacha um uh, at this time it was the transport pilot that was with me uh, next door to me in the, in the airplane um and remember i said to you the rainy season had just started on that day um we left late morning and the, and the storms, the thunderstorms we were building big time uh, from the sort of northeast. And that was kind of the direction that we were flying. Now, you know, yourself flying with thunderstorms, the cloud base around about that part of the year, that part of the, the world is usually around about 1800 feet and then it goes down to about 1500, depending on the storm and all that. But they can go up to height wise, they can go up to like 60,000 feet. So, as far as the Queen Air was concerned, it wasn't such a great idea to fly around in thunderstorms at 10,000, 15,000 feet. So um, we elected to, um, I elected to fly sort of um, just below the cloud base at 1,500 feet. Um, and then um, and then kind of zigzag through the storm. So that's what we did. Um, as you know, there was um, um, very limited navigation aids in those days uh, in Namibia at the time. Um, however, there was one really big one. It was that, that the big road from Krotfontein to Rundu to Katima. Now, I didn't tell them. I kept quiet, and I, but I kept the road in the distance, there in the distance. And when I wasn't exactly sure we were, we just head a little bit to the left, and I thought, okay, back again. Um, so that's how it worked. But, you know, I must tell you, now this is part of the one part of the flying that was really interesting was, um, so we had the, the helo driver with me, we're flying at about 1500 feet and we zigzagging through the thunderstorms and it's starting to bucket down. It's really, it rained, but daundered. Now I must tell you, that's a good Afrikaans word because it actually explains what it means. Um, so it rained, at some, you know, sometimes we couldn't see anything. It was as though somebody was pouring a bucket of water over our aircraft. Um, the guy next to me was flying, he was like white knuckles, he was sweaty. And I was just sitting there, nice and controlled, relaxing, a little bit left, a little bit right, as we sort of zigzagged through the through the thunderstorm, thunderstorms. Um, you're doing well. Um, keep it up. Um, as we sort of kept those uh, kept out the way of the big red cells on the on the on the weather radar, you know. So it was really interesting. Anyway, we popped out the 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 the, the clouds there, sort of near Fort Dopi's kind of thing. Um, and we arrived in Katima or Mapacha a little bit later, just after lunch. Um, and we stayed at what is now called, I think, the Safari Lodge. Um, and then, of course, you know, when we got there, geez, it was, you know, that smell, that African bush smell after the rains, that beautiful, clean, everything's washed. And that smell is just amazing. Eh? So, um, so, yeah, that was, that's what I can remember about that. Uh, after lunch, then we... Um, we then spent a whole afternoon uh, tiger fishing on the Zambezi River. Um, and I remember, you know, sitting in the in the boats there thinking, geez, I can't believe our luck. The after the rains, the fish were super, super active. 
Um, and we stayed on the water until, oh, I don't know, sun, just, just on, on, on sun, sun, sunset, you know. Um, and boy, did the guys catch fish. It was, fan, the, 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 it was wonderful. Top class fishing. Um, and then that evening, um, we enjoyed another spectacular meal. You know, lots of fish and lots of brine, and pop and sauce. Um, you know, these guys, I, I must tell you, these Americans, they couldn't believe what pop and sauce was. You know, Sherba, the, the sauce, they were blown away by the stuff. Um, anyway, so we had a great meal. And then we sat outside, the, you know, like, um, uh, like pigged out, really stomachs. We sat out on the, on the banks of the river, having our, having our glass of wine while we carry on talking and things like that. It was absolutely wonderful trip, fantastic food, good flying good fishing, good hunting, everything worked out spectacular, really, really good. Um, but what I'll do now is I'll sort of, I'll, I'll, I'll move off from the flying back to the politic to give a bit of context to, to the story. Um, so basically, as I got to know the three chaps, you know, through them flying the aircraft and us talking and having a beer and, and them asking me questions and I'm asking them questions, um, it got, it, it became very obvious that uh, they were exceptionally well informed about the whole sort of sector 10 situation, um, as well as the overall uh, political scenario. Um, all three were very knowledgeable. They were very, um, very astute, very pleasant people, um, uh, interested in local customs and, and, and the foods and the nature. Um, so I must, I have to reiterate, all three of these chaps were really good gents, um, generally very engaging, um, very respectful, well-spoken, articulate. Um, I can't speak highly enough about them. Um, as example, the one chap, the one, the, 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 the transport pilot chap, um, he was so blown away by this pop and sauce that uh, when we got to, um, um, to Safari Lodge then, Katima, he was the guy that went to the kitchen you wanted to get back a bit quicker so that you could go into the kitchen and find out how do they make this pop? How do they make this, the share by this? Because he wanted to take some home and blah, blah, blah. He was really, you know, they were that kind of person. They were, they were, they were very um, um, amenable folks. Um, anyway, after a while, you know, once the four started to gel, as it were, um, I got to start asking more questions like, what do you guys, what's the bigger picture here? Um, why are you gents actually here? And then, of course, they started talking. Um, if, you, if you think about it, at the Tosha, the first two nights, you know, the general talk was about the present situation. And uh, they asked me questions uh, while they, they you know, provided incredible details and knowledge of the, you know, uh, the UN negotiation process and, um, and and basically the realities of the day. Who's using what weapons? Um, what what um, groups have have not stuck to whatever agreement? Um, they knew all about this kind of thing. Um, and then as as discussions sort of progressed, I asked more sort of pertinent, specific questions. So asking, so what is your role? Um, what do you, you know? What is the negotiation process really about? What are the hindering points? Does the process actually work? Um, will it be successful? You know, all these kinds of things. Um, and they started talking. So, for example, um, um, I remember clearly um, this one, that that one evening in Safari Lodge, then Katima, after we had all eaten, we were sitting like in this in this, if you can imagine, a half moon shape, facing the river, right on the river bank there. And we're sitting there, we've had a lack of meal, um, and we're having our, our, our uh, sort of uh, nightcap. And, um, and the one guy then sort of, um, he took a, a, a stick and he smoothed, smoothed uh, how can I say, he smoothed the sand out, flattened the sand in front of us then. And then with, his, with that stick, he, he talked and he wrote down and he drew his conceptualization of, uh, of the negotiation process um, going forward. Um, in the sand there, he actually drew it and wrote it down. Now, I wish I had a camera. You know, if I had a, I wish I had a mobile phone so I could have taken that photo, a, cam, a photograph of that. And I'll tell you why later. Anyway, um, now to put this into perspective, uh, 
you must remember that these three chaps were from um, from the Chester Crocker School of 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 negotiation. Now, I'm sure people remember the name Chester Crocker. He was the um, uh, the Assistant Secretary of State, I think, for African African Affairs in the in the 1980s. Um, now, I'm not going to go into detail, but the Chester Crock, and I don't know the detail anyway, but I do remember that what he told, what they told me. And um, basically, the Chester no Crocker negotiation process involved what they called uh, constructive engagement. Now, in other words, that was just using positive incentives rather than having negative incentives. So, for example, South Africa was under sanctions uh, and under huge public pressure uh, and 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 Chester Crocker said that doesn't work in negotiations. You must rather have the, the carrot approach rather than the stick approach. Um, he sort of also highlighted the uh, the concept of red lines, that negotiations have, uh, parties have red lines, and um, these red lines often have to be relinquished or given up for the process to continue. Um, and he had ideas how to do that and 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 uh, and, and, and processes to to work on that. Um, as an example, you would say like um, um, a red line could be two red lines. Not all red lines are the same value or the same weight. So maybe if you linked two red lines on the one side, that would equate to another a red line on the other side, and then maybe they would negotiate to to dispel those. Um, another concept he wrote about or, he, or they spoke about was um, that it was important to identify policies or red lines that, um, that uh, maybe the, the people at the time, the groups at the time, didn't understand that if that one continued, if that red line was allowed to go forward, um, it might lead to further problems later in, in a couple of years later for the environment. Um, and so you needed, um, he, he, he thought about, you, you know, they talked about um, having a third party, an informed person um, who can distinguish between these red lines and what they mean and so on and so forth um, as an independent person to advise the, the negotiating parties. Um, so this is kind of the, 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 the policy that uh, they talked about the Chester Crocker type negotiation process of which these gents were, were part of it. Um, and as you know, the, that solution 45 was eventually signed in, um, in uh, early in, in 1990, I think it was, um, when they sort of, they lowered the South African flag and the Namibian flag went up. Now, what I want to highlight is that what was written in the sand that night, okay? So basically, they lay, they, they lay out the, the, uh, the context, um, Cuba and the Soviet Union, um, they wanted out, they wanted to bring it to an end because it was costing too much. It was taking far longer than they thought. Um, South Africa had less sort of concern about the, um, the, the total onslaught. Um, and they were a lot more worried about the international sanctions and uh, internal challenges back home. And of course the costs, everybody was worried about the costs. Um, and foreign backers were pulling out of the support for the Angolan government and for uh, for Jonas Savimbi's UNITA. Um, and so, it, you know, it was leaving everybody with little choice but to get to the negotiation table. Um, but I clearly remember on the sand on the sand that night. Okay. So for example, you'd say, right, well, this is this is the process that um, that is uh, that's a good process. Um, so you'll say, look, overall it'll take seven to eight um, very quick actually, seven to eight months. Um, with the sort of um, a complex series of, of steps culminating in, in uh, the holding of elections. And he drew them out there on the, water, on, on, on the sand. So I remember, like, for example, there would be a D-Day implement, implementation day. Um, and that was, that was when the ceasefire happened uh, between South Africa and SWAPO, as it were. Um, and then on that D-Day, then all combatants would, would, would throw down their weapons and they would return to base and they'd be confined to base. And then that D-Day, from there, everything worked re retrospectively. So six weeks after D-Day would be when the South African SADF had to withdraw their forces. They could only, uh, down to 
uh, 12,000 people. Withdraw their forces down to 12,000 people. Uh, swap had to do their thing, FAPL had to do their, their, their kind of thing. Um, the 12th week, South Africa had to further reduce uh, personnel down to 1,500. Um, they had to close their bases. They could only have two bases open. Um, again, SWAP had to also do X, Y, and Z. Um, at the 12th week, the SADF command structures had to be dismantled, and all weapons and arms had to be put under under uh, UNTAG, United Nations Guard supervision, as it were. Um, and then, so it was 6, 12, 13th week, and then 13th week was uh, the beginning of the election campaign. And what did that mean? Well, that, that was all about... Um, um, releasing political prisoners, um, chain, you know, updating or how can I say, uh, releasing or changing the restrictive laws affecting free and fair elections, as it were. Uh, those those laws had to be repealed um, they had to allow for the uh, peaceful, so-called peaceful return of former Swapo forces uh, into Namibia uh, under UNTAG supervision, as it were. Um, but these were kind of all the things um, written out on the sand that night. Um, so yeah, I was. You, you can imagine. Um, I, I literally, I literally sat there in awe. I, here I was at the age of twenty-one, being taught a critical uh, piece of history, analytical piece of history, uh, from the horse's mouth, from the people that do it, design it. Um, well, I'm sitting here next to the Zambezi uh, River after great days fishing, um, having another beer or glass of wine. I was absolutely blown away. So, um, so yeah, anyway, you'll, I'll highlight this a little bit later, why that was quite important. So that night we all slept well, very, very well. Um, and then the next morning after breakfast, uh, we departed uh, for Terrace Bay, which is on the West Coast. Um, I remember it was bright, clear, Gin clear day, much as it is here today, uh, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and we flew basically, we flew low level 500 foot all the way. Um, um, so basically, we again flew back down past, uh, down, you know, down the, down the road. Again, I didn't tell them, kept it in the distance. Um, we flew past Rundu. They hadn't seen Rundu because of the rain. Uh, so I showed them that. And then we flew to uh, on Dengs, or Shikati and Ruakana. Um, we actually stopped in on Dengs. Um, we got a message because um, they had to go and see the OC to get some sort of update or whatever it was. Um, that gave me opportunity to refuel the aircraft and to clean her up. Um, and then, um, and so, and so we left. Um, when we got to Ruakana, I flew around a little bit as well to show them this is where the negotiation is going to happen the following week and uh, show them the Pupa Falls and all that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, and then we flew, basically uh, flew through the, uh, what I call the Zebra Mountains, um, down towards the coast. I think they're Okombambi, Okombambi Kuneni Mountains, as they call them in, 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 uh, in Namibia. Um, and then, uh, so we got to the coast. Uh, I've got to tell you, flying around that part of the world is stunning. Um, beautiful, beautiful mountains. Um, deep valleys, um, but long valleys and valleys that have got exits. So you don't get to the, you don't get yourself caught in a valley where you have to turn around or climb over. There are, but a lot of the valleys you can fly down a valley and come out on the other side. Absolutely stunning. Anyway, we got to the coast um, and then we, um, we headed down southwards now um, and basically flew um, just above the waves, uh, low enough that the, the, the spray was, uh, was on the windscreen and we had to use the windscreen wipe, wipers a bit. But you can imagine, gin clear day, bright, bright sun, um, and we just flying down the coast like that with the, the beach on the left-hand side, the waves below us, and this absolutely pristine ocean, dark, dark blue out to the right hand side and we just flew down dead quiet absolutely stunning absolutely beautiful um by the way um i had been at um um i'd been at 27 squadron for quite a while by then and 35 squadron and i'd been to terrace bay with 27 squadron a few times 
so I was quite experienced with um, the way the weather worked and the runway and the approach channel, the runway challenges and things like that. Now, um, on this particular um, uh, day, um, I'd checked the weather forecast and like that time of the year, the fog would come in sort of four o'clock-ish. Um, it would come in and by five o'clock, it would be campers. So I imagined and I planned to be there at two o'clock. Um, anyway, with our, with our dilly-dallying and that, um, it, it meant that we actually arrived at three o'clock um, when the fog was closing in fast. That last few minutes of the flight, uh, approaching Terrace Bay, the flying downward as it were, the fog had sort of reached us and was starting to in envelop over the aircraft, over towards the beach. Um, it was really um, uh, tight. We managed to do our sort of our little teardrop and the approach and we landed. And I must tell you that last bit of the, the landing was just, just enough visual to see the runway uh, markings. Uh, by the time we had landed, taxied up to the runway, uh, up to the dispersal there and parked the aircraft and, and deplaned and chucked the airplane, um, it was pea soup. Couldn't see anything in front of you. Um, so we were absolutely spot on as far as time was concerned. Um, the weather had come in an hour and a bit earlier. Um, and um, and uh, we were just very, very fortunate. That's for sure. Um, uh, anyway, um, again, that whole after the, the rest of the afternoon and that evening, we spent on the, uh, we spent doing that, uh, doing the fishing thing. Um, there on the skeleton coast, that cold water fishing, something to behold, as, as everybody knows. Um, and again, the chaps were very fortunate. We were all very fortunate. They were catching all sorts of rays and, and stembrus and cabalio, uh, by a by a lacquer. It was wonderful. Um, you know, I'm, I have to tell you, I, I can remember like, I don't know, it's difficult to explain, but you can imagine yourself. Um, it's the fog is thick. We've spread out a little bit. Um, you've cast in, so you're just waiting now for that tug. Um, it's just you. It's just you and the elements. Um, um, you, you, you sort of, how can I go? You sort of um, re reduce yourself or you sort of go into your own world um, and, you, and you, you find you eventually you look left and look right. There's nobody there. It's just you. It's just the sound of the wave, super super relaxing that's that strong smell of the water uh, very spiritual absolutely fantastic it was like um something that i'd, I'd i will never forget um it was really great um and then even to top it was even better because later that evening um johan the the, the camp manager um, i'd known him from you know all the flights before and really nice guy um he had made a absolutely sumptuous poiki for, for us and the guests, um, um, very meaty, um, and along with um, homemade bread, um, uh, with homemade um, fig and apricot jam, you know, feia and what's it, uh, apple quiz, eh? Yeah, jam. So those, you know, that lack of thick bread with that jam, it's like, oh man, to die for, absolutely stunning. So I remember that, I mean, it's making my mouth water right now. Uh, I really, it was one of those wonderful evenings with excellent food, wonderful conversation, uh, West Coast conversation, um, lots of fishing stories. It was fabulous. Um, and, and we slept dead that night. It was very like a, um, so that, so that Terrace Bay night was another fabulous night. Um, so the next day then, um, we were then from Terrace Bay to Eros, back to Vintook. Um, we did a few more hours fishing in the morning, and then we left just after lunch. Um, we flew back to Vintook. Again, we flew low level down the coast um, towards uh, just past Hinty's Bay, Hinty's Bay. Um, then we turned inland. Um, I perfectly got us to climb up to, I think it was like 5,000 feet. Um, so that we get to the Eros CTA, which is 50 miles, which is where the Omotako Mount, Omotakos Mountains are, um, which is something to behold, um, uh, for especially for visitors. Um, 
And um, you know what Matakos is, by the way? No, okay. Well, Matakos is um, is a I think it's a Hereru name for 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 women's breasts. And you'll see um, the photograph is um, so you can see the the, the two mountains. Um, so that's just coincidentally fifty miles from 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 Vintuk, and that's where if you if you're a local person, the air traffic controllers always say to you call the CTA, or they'll say to you if they know that you're local, they will say call Umutakos. And so that's an ATC thing. Um, uh, interesting for me to show the pilots and the and and the the, the three of them, and they loved it. They took photographs and things like that. Um, Anyway, then we we flew an approach, clear skies, zero wind, no traffic, um, into into Eros, into runway onto runway one nine. I remember setting the autopilot in. I put the I engaged the autopilot at sort of one and a half degrees approach. We hadn't used the autopilot at all the whole trip. It was hand flying the whole trip, excepting for the approach phase into into Vintuk. Um, and we basically kissed onto the ground and uh, to end. A, a most memorable sortie, a really unbelievable time that uh, that we all had. Um, we then sort of said our jolly goodbyes. Um, I never saw the gentleman ever again. Um, a few days later, Dick Lord called me in, um, gave me a bit of a debrief. He said the, the the diplomats they were like they were amazed by the Namibian nature. Um, and they thanked us for the super trip. They really enjoyed every single minute. Um, and by the way, they also said uh, they were very impressed with Steve Scott's flying skills. Uh, but um, I can understand why. Eh? But little did they know, there was a little bit of a back door there that I always kept. Eh? <laughs> um, but anyway, um, the last thing I wanted to sort of mention was getting back to the politic. Um, now, again, uh, I don't have a photographic memory, but I think we all can and do often remember clearly certain instances. Uh, um, past events, as it were. Um, so it was quite interesting for me, about sort of like almost two years, 20 months after this trip, um, that um, it was very surprising for me to see on the front page of the Sunday newspapers that um, the headlines, you know, the United Nations 435 had finally been signed by all parties um, at that um, the Tri-Party Accord they uh, uh, signed at the United Nations in New York. Um, and then on the page, on that front page, was a schematic of the agreed process, as it were, uh, for everybody to see. Now, that's what I wanted to talk about today, and this is the, the, this is the punchline, is that schematic that was on the front page of the newspaper was exactly what was written in the sand two years before in Katima, that love that that night after a wonderful meal and after one wonder, that wonderful day's fishing um and that was that so the drawing in the sand was exactly what was in the newspaper so to me then uh what does that mean well i'll leave it up to up to people that are listening to 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 come up with their own uh, their own um uh, ideas um so that was it um pussy another fabulous saf memory that i have something i'll never ever forget and um, yeah, so right, Fussy, that's it. As I say, flat, flat, may story is eight. <laughs> well, um, it's not really eight. You've got many uh, eight because you, I think you've got many more stories. Uh, but we'll keep it a, a little bit brief today. Yeah. Uh, but before I let you go, uh, no, carry on anytime, anything. When you come back next time, you must tell us about that funny shaped ball and your exploits on on the, the rugby field, please, sir. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to ask me about this trip, but anyway, if you're asking about rugby, there's always thousands of stories about rugby, whether you play or whether you referee or whether you coach. Um, there's many, many stories, and and and. and I've been really luckily. It's not it's not me. I've just been very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. So. I'll give you one example. Um, flying my last 20 years, or the 20 years I flew in Emirates, I was all on the 777. The last, or most of those years, I then uh, started refereeing rugby. Um, and, and with the ability to semi-roster or bid for my flights. So, for example, I would uh, bid 
Saturday mornings, um, the, the morning flight to get to Gatwick or to get to Heathrow or to get to Manchester. Um, I would then contact the RFU and say, right, I'm in, um, I'm in the UK that day, and then they would allocate me a game. So at one time, I was fortunate enough to be a, um, a registered referee in the UK, in South Africa, of course, Dubai, Australia, Singapore, and New Zealand, all at the same time. And so depending on where I was going, I would send those people uh, my roster and say, look, I'm there. Uh, would you like to use me? And of course, they would lap it up because I'm an independent dude. So um, what was really interesting was I always found that I got the uh, the derbies, the derby matches, the ones that always ended last season, ended up in a big fight. Um, so then they get get this guy that's flying in this, the Sapphire, get him in to, to, to referee the game. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, I can think of many stories, and one day, if we've got the time, we can we can talk about those. That's for sure. Yeah, thanks for that, Steve. But just before I let you go, I think I said that just now too. Uh, yeah. One question did spring to mind, but you sort of covered it at the end of uh, the debrief. Weren't the int guys all over you when you landed back in Vintuk for for the art gen? The int guys. Yeah, the, the intelligence lot, weren't they all over you? Because you had the the the, the story. I mean <laughs> No, there was no there was no it wasn't the operational flight, it was a jolly flight. So we didn't even have an in briefing as such. I actually did go to the in guys beforehand uh, just to ask them um if there's anything, you know, we were sort of all where we were gonna fly and, and they said no, no, there's nothing. So um, it was nothing um, for the int guys as, as such. And, you know, to be very honest, I didn't even think about the politic, as I want to call it. Um, that was what happened on the trip. I, I learned a hell of a lot. Um, but I hadn't, I didn't really um, cognitify it, really, until two years later when I saw this newspaper I started thinking, my brain started saying, what the heck, you know, I've seen this before. And then I started reading up a little bit about it and speaking to fellow colleagues. And then I realized, yeah, man, this is, um, this is quite interesting. Uh, to me, um, the negotiation process, uh, again, it's up to other people to decide and to think. Uh, but for me, it was destined, it was pre-planned, um, and it was just they just waited for the parties to negotiate down to that point. In the meantime, many people had lost their lives and lots of, uh, lots of weapons had been destroyed and, 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 and places had been messed up, um, which was, uh, which was uh, part of why I was quite, quite surprised, put it that way. Well, I do thank you. No sweat. I do thank <laughs> you. I'm sure it's opening a can of worms, but it's worms that maybe need to be just aired and then maybe forgotten and somebody can just say, okay, well, that was interesting. You know, let's see what happens. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not too sure about the can of worm side. I think this is the, what it will interest. It will, it will, it will pique people's in, inquisitive nature to know, to, to realize that this you were witnessing a key moment in time and you lived there, and you lived through it, and you only, as you say, it was only 20 months later when you saw it in the newspapers that it makes sense that you had seen this that much of time before. And, uh, yeah, makes you wonder, with what what is happening in the world today, how long um, the strings haven't been pulled? That's all <laughs> I'm, I'm about to say, <laughs> or I'm going to say. Otherwise, of course, I'll have to kick my posterior off this channel for dragging <laughs> legacy conversations into the dwang. Yeah. So, Steve, I'm going to say thank you very, very much. Folk out there, I'm going to urge you to go and look at the Coventry University website. Uh, if you're at all interested in uh, the design and the human factors element, uh, I'm constantly waffling on about safety aviation safety that's what aviation does to you it hammers safety the mental into you and yeah 
So the, all these years later, you come from it from an aviation side and not only from an engineering side, but you can combine the two to teach engineers how to think because there are engineers out there that go on a certain path and they yeah. never, uh, the paths never cross. So for me, it's fantastic. And I, I must ad admit, I haven't quite got to reading some of your pieces yet because I run around like a, yeah, I won't say <laughs> what, most of the time chasing other pursuits, well, my favorite pursuits. And then uh, this fun of, of doing the legacy conversations has, has absolutely astounded me in the last few months. So from my point of view, as I always say, um, until we meet again, God bless. Same to you. Keep safe. God bless and uh, enjoy the rugby this weekend and uh, keep smiling. Keep smiling. That's what we must do. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Much appreciated. Cheers for seeing you. Keep on, eh? Bye. Bye.